I'm a serial entrepreneur that's been focused on solving problems at the intersection of technology and content for more than a decade. So the first company that I built was a startup called Byline, which, is a, which was a crowdfunded journalism platform. A month or two months before the cash runs out, I launched a company. We miraculously got 10K per a month, and I actually moved my startup from London to Silicon Valley. So I felt, okay, wow, this is gonna work. But actually, you know, it took me at least three to four more years until I got an inflection point. Every startup is an overnight success, but it happens on actually not just 500 night. Hello, uh, this is SY. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Story. We're building the world's IP blockchain and with the particular focus on building the programmable intellectual property layer. We're one of the fastest uh, growing ecosystem. We were very fortunate enough to actually have raised great funding. I previously founded a consumer app that sold to Cacao for half a billion dollars. We have a lot of builders, you know, 400 plus builders who are actually building on top of our ecosystem to solve problems together uh, that, that we are tackling. I was very interested in socioeconomic problems from a very young age. I had this unique upbringing where I lived at the outskirts of Seoul, where it was a very developing area of Seoul, where you had a lot of kind of low-income family, but also a new apartments were getting built, so you have some professional middle-class families coming in. So I, I saw like this stock income inequality and ended up kind of moving to like a very rich private school, transferring out to that school. And I was exposed to this kind of massive income inequality. I started thinking about why is society like this? I read up on history and so on and so forth. And I really got interested in politics, philosophy and economics were the best subjects to kind of understand these problems. That drew me to Oxford. And I thought the two biggest levers around kind of impacting society was one was actually going into politics. The second was actually going into uh, media. So the first company that I built was a startup called Byline, which was a crowdfunded journalism platform. And the kind of the chief reason why I built the platform was that the advertising driven model for news and journalism was getting collapsed. And all these independent journalists were getting unemployed. And I wanted to create a platform where these journalists and reporters can directly pitch to readers about what they want to write about and uh, match the demand of the readers. It was uh, almost like a pre-sub stack. It was extremely hard because not many projects were getting funded. Okay, I have some cash left. I have this great team who I gather try to tackle something at the intersection of content and technology. I've had experience around helping mo creators monetize content, especially with writers. And I went kind of the opposite of journalism in this kind of written content, which was fiction. I was dealing with facts, dealing with uh, journalistic content. I was going to very fictional content. And the reason why I pivoted to that kind of vertical was at the time, I, I came from South Korea. In Korea, everyone was reading what they call webtoon and also web novels. So these are bi-sized episodic content that you read on the phone that are serialized weekly or some even daily. On smartphones, you can really easily folks reading this kind of content in subways in Korea. I was looking at the trend in my home country in Korea, I thought basically that trend of smartphone reading, smartphone reading of serialized content was actually delayed in the US because US, instead of jumping straight to smartphone reading, they were actually reading on Kindle devices, eBooks. So I thought, wow, uh, there's going to be an opportunity and people are just going to kind of read this kind of snackable episodic content on the phone in the same way it did in Korea, Japan, and China. So why don't I actually bring a, start a mobile platform focused on this segment of content and also bring the business models that actually worked out in, in Korea. And I thought that was a shot. I then pivoted my startup to Radish, which was a mobile serialized fiction platform. And initially, you know, and I had about two to four months left uh, in terms of cash runway. A month or two months before kind of the cash runs out, I launched a company and we miraculously got 10K per a month in terms of revenue. And I actually moved my startup from London to Silicon Valley, kind of listening to the advice. And I got some, you know, good big name Silicon Valley investors, like Greylock to, you know, lowercase capital and so on and so forth. So I felt, okay, wow, this is gonna work. I'm in Silicon Valley, I have these great investors. Now there's some revenue coming. But actually, you know, it took me at least three to four more years until I got an inflection point and actually started seeing some kind of up and to the right curve for the business. The company was stagnant for, I think, three to four years after that launch. One year into it, it was still flat. After that fundraising, I started thinking like, what can I do? 
and I started just try to knock on doors of veteran employees of you know successful startups who've actually been there and done that. It was a very tough experience in terms of like changing the team, getting new members, and trying to hire new people. So that kind of team transformation was a very very tough experience for me because I. Never done that. It requires a massive emotional energy. And once I got the team, I was pretty naive. I, mean, I, I brought all these very, very talented people and expensive people, actually. I brought them on with the expectation that there were. It's going to be more cash coming into the business. And I had like a next promise of $5 million of funding. And actually, like a few weeks before, it, that fell apart. And I was pretty naive. And one thing that you should know as a, st a startup entrepreneur is one, until the money hits the bank, it's not an actual funding, right? And then I had a year of cash crunch for about 12 to 13 months straight. I had only a month or sometime at its worst, like a few weeks of cash left. That was massively stressful because I was trying to put on a poker face. Everything's going well. Everything's fine. But in reality, you know, the cash was running out. No one wants to fund cash crunch startup, but I had to keep things going. So there's this concept of convertible debt, right? Which is a kind of a, in one, on the one hand, a debt instrument. On the other hand, it's like an investment instrument. So it's basically still a debt. So I was getting debt after debt, convertible debt, kind of coming into the company. So I had like about 20 to 25 convertible debts that I signed uh, to get the company going. And at, at one point, I ran out of I really ran out of cash and the debt convertible that I was promised was not coming in. So I had to take some loan out against my personal credit, take some loan out from my family, about I think 250K, 200K. I just never wanted to cross that line, but I had to. And then I even had to rely on my best friend who actually came all the way to America to kind of follow my journey. I had to even ask him to lend that money. I miraculously ended up raising about, raising about you know, seven to eight million dollars of funding. And I had a sec, like a, the last shot to actually execute on the vision. The biggest lesson I learned uh, is that every startup is an overnight success, but it happens on actually not just 500th night, like 2000th night or 3000th night. It takes a long time to make this happen. You have a lot of startups that you see that, wow, it just came out of nowhere. But they had this long stagnant line. One of the toughest things as an entrepreneur is in that stagnant line, you don't know when it's actually going to grow up. That is that huge uncertainty. So how do you actually keep on going? What really kept me going was that I, although I quantitatively, numerically, see a hockey stick growth, that is happening in front of me visually. I, I still felt that I was improving as an entrepreneur. The team was getting better. The strategy was getting better. I was starting to get funding. I was just learning a lot more. And the secondly, I also felt that there's always something to try. If this doesn't work, the next thing's gonna work. The next thing's gonna work. So that kind of kept me going. And suddenly there's one moment where everything kind of clicks. And because you've been waiting for that moment for so long, when something clicks, you just desperately want to grab it, right? You, you want to do everything to sustain that. You don't want to fuck it up. You don't want to let it go, right? So you just grab on it and you hold on to it uh, because you don't want to make that overnight success just overnight dream. You want to turn that into a sustainable growth. Knowing that it's going to take a long time is, is very important. So I always tell an entrepreneur in short term be pessimistic in midterm be a little bit even more pessimistic but in long term be optimistic because in long term the only that optimism can keep you going any great startup will take five six seven or eight or nine years it's, it's it takes a lot of time even then you're still lucky because i've had a lot of friends who've worked on a startup five years ten years twelve years but it doesn't go anywhere yeah so that's kind of the biggest learning. It takes a long time to make something great happen. Probably someone that created the most disruptive media and journalism platform at the time when I was uh, running Byline was the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. And he was the enemy of all the governments and he had to find his refugee. He said he had to find his asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. And I had a chance to interview him directly uh, in the embassy. He was the first person that I've seen who's deeply political, philosophical, but at the same time deeply technical. The best way to describe him, he was very intellectually original. 
I was a very struggling entrepreneur at the time. Uh, I was running out of money. Byline wasn't going as well as I expected. So I had a lot of doubts. You know, it's my first time at, uh, starting a company. Julian Assange was, you know, when, he, when I met him, he was actually speaking about a much bigger scale problem than the problem that I was talking about, which is like, okay, how to fix journalism. He said, basically he said, you know, the Western society is building a new kind of God. It's a surveillance God. He said basically big tech is a new kind of God who's om like omnipresent, omniscient. They know everything that's going on. They're everywhere. What they're doing is they're basically training and collecting all your data, all your information and making this insane AI an insane surveillance system was kind of what he was arguing. And they're going to be having dramatically, ri exponentially rising, monopolizing power over everyone's lives, everyone's information. And that centralizing power over all of us uh, is something that we need to think very, very deeply about. That really left a mark on me, but at the same time, I'm, str I'm just a struggling entrepreneur who's trying to make ends meet. My startup is kind of running out of cash. I'm not getting a product market fit. And you know, he's talking about this massive grand problem, but you know, what can I do, right? When I first started Byline, I was like 22, 23. And then when I started Radish, I was like 25. And, and obviously I had a lot of ups and downs. The startup ended up getting acquired by um, Kakao for almost a half a billion dollars in 2020. And I left Kakao and I, I started Story. The big reason why I ended up starting Story is I really felt that at the end of the day, I didn't tackle the mission that I really wanted to. For me, I had this massive ambition with Byline. The industry of journalism was getting collapsed. In, in the industry of media was getting collapsed with all these big advertising revenue being taken away to big tech. I wanted to tackle this massive problem and I kind of, I had to give up on it. So I had to focus on a mobile platform, mobile content platform, mobile fiction platform. There's also focus on mobile romance and it's, it's, like, it's a serialized content. So I had to go very, very deep and narrow and to monopolize a niche and to actually work on that, you know, to, to take over that niche and try to expand down the line later, right? It was a good run, but one of the kind of chief reasons I ended up selling their company was that realizing the fact that I'm just kind of a, one, of, one of many small fish in that content ecosystem. I was drawing a bunch of money on marketing to big tech companies to get my content noticed and discovered. I was uh, you know, spending a lot of money on content. I was kind of fighting this zero sum war against other content platforms to get more attention. I, I just saw the, the business, you know, not scaling in a way that I wanted to, unless I kind of joined forces with other bigger companies that has a bigger content budget and marketing budget. I wanted to make a company with massive impact, but I ended up kind of having to get my company acquired. It was a great, great success. It was, it was good success. All the shareholders won. It was a really good personal outcome, but I didn't build a transformative company and like game-changing company that I w I've wanted to build. And what was really fortunate was that I had a good exit. I was still young. I have this now great network. I have these great financial resources. And above all, I have this experience. While that fresh feeling was alive, I really want to tackle a bigger problem at the intersection of content technology. Uh, one of my advisors and investors said is that going from zero to one, especially making a very disruptive, transformative, business. You want to do that in your 20s or maybe at early 30s at the latest. It's almost like being an athlete. So every single company that you think of that are trillion dollar plus with massive kind of market impact and societal impact, they were being started by early mid 20 something and at the latest 30 or 31, right? When I sold my company, I was 30 and I felt like, okay, I don't know why I thought that, but the time is running out. If you're going to start a business anyway, maybe you should do it now because that's your prime time. We are at a massive crossroad. One is that IP can have a massively empowering moment because everyone is becoming a content studio. Social media made everyone a creator, but now they are a studio because with their fingertips, they can make incredible content with just an idea, with the, just a prompt, you can do that, right? It's ex massively empowering, but at the same time, it's m in a massively, huge danger because people are training and stealing your content, content without your consent and they're hijacking your future traffic. So as story, we want to maximize that empowering effect. We want to minimize that harmful and dangerous impact of just non-consensual without your permission 
other big AI models and big tech taking over your company, right? We have a pretty defensive vision, what I call defensive vision. The reason why I call it defensive is we are helping creators protect their IP in this age of AI and get the fair compensation. But I also have a more empowering vision. I, I want to also play an offense. IP can't just sit and try to protect themselves. The IP needs to play offense. Right? Uh, creators need to play offense and they should fully utilize the technology that is this powerful technology that is generative AI. And I think that for me, that is actually turning the internet into an IP Lego land. If you give every creator amazing set of IP Legos, imagine that millions of characters created by your fellow creators, millions of games that are created by other fellow creators, all these story universes that are created by fellow creators are actually a Lego piece that you can utilize while giving them fair compensation, attribution, and provenance. And now you have this magic wand of generative AI, right? Combine these two things, we'll see an explosion of creativity. We'll see a digital renaissance because it's amazing that you have this magical tool of generative AI. And it's amazing. You have this entire playground of IPs that you can use as a Lego piece. So I think only sky's the limit when, when you can empower all of us to have those IP Legos and generative AI.